Okay, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, we will talk today about the genomic analysis of SARS-CoV-2 new variants in uh, this time when the vaccine is starting to be administered all over the world. And so what we want to do is we want to just discuss some of the variants that are appearing and what are some of the biological factors behind this. And uh, first of all, um, let me introduce our first speaker. So Dr. Gus Kasulis, who is the head of Department of Pathobiological Sciences. And uh, he's also the director of the Division of Biotechnology and Molecular Medicine, Biomed, at the School of Veterinary Medicine at the Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. And he is also the principal investigator of Louisiana Biomedical Research Network, LBRN, and the president of the National Association of IDEA Principal Investigators, NAPI. So Gus, I will pass it over to you. Okay, thank you, Laya. Let me share my screen. Um, Okay, I hope everybody sees my screen right now. Uh, Eli, let me know if there's an issue. Yeah, we can see your screen, but we don't see the full slide. We see, I think, the presenter view. Oh, this is uh, potentially an issue that we never resolved here. Um, I see. If I put it on the presentation mode, that's where it goes. Um, so I just wonder if there's a trick that you know. Uh, uh, yeah, down there. Yeah, down there. If you, um, I think uh, you see. No, keep go back to that screen real quick. Okay. In the presenter mode. In the presenter mode. And on top, you see you have end show tips and then swap displays. So click on swap displays. It's on the top left corner. Yep, swap displays. There we go. Now we can see the right view. You did it? Okay, all right. That's good to know. Okay, well, um, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, thank you, Laya, for the introduction. What are we gonna try to do today is give you a glimpse um, perhaps on uh, what is going on now for all these new variants that have been appearing worldwide. And we hope that uh, this introduction is uh, a sort of an introduction of a couple of different things that we're doing with the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network, as well as with LSU. Uh, we uh, have formulated the graduate course, BBS 7003, Section 2, that will be starting somewhere mid-February, concentrating on uh, analysis tools, bioinformatic tools, for looking at sequences from simple alignments all the way to structural prediction, and looking at some of the topics that we'll be discussing today. Also, in addition, uh, in collaboration with Pine Biotech and uh, Lai Brodsky, that uh, was our uh, organizer for this webinar, we're going to be offering a cadre of different uh, bioinformatics courses that will be virtually delivered through the LBRN network, and it will be underwritten by LBRN for those that belong to the LBRN network. And uh, we hope that Pine Biotech will also extend the discount for others that may be relating uh, indirectly to our network, one way or the other. So um, I want to do a brief introduction to the topic. Uh, some time ago, I gave a full hour lecture on the molecular and cellular biology of SARS-CoV-2 and coronaviruses uh, specifically. And that lecture has been taped. It was as a, in fact, two hour lecture because we had my uh, lecture up front and Eli Brodsky gave the second part of the lecture where we did a very detailed analysis of the molecular cell biology of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And that lecture is taped and is available 
I believe, on the LBRN uh, network for those that may want to uh, hear more of the specifics of the molecular cell biology and uh, other tools that have been used to analyze uh, those uh, genomes and uh, the structures or the predicted structures of different proteins. So as an introduction today, what I want to do is focus specifically and highlight the uh, possibility, in fact, the uh, actuality, that uh, coronaviruses are really more error prone than people think, because there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, uh, discussing the fact that uh, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase that's important for the replication of the virus has proofreading activity. Therefore, the genomes shouldn't really be that variant. But in fact, as you'll see, and we'll be discussing, that this coronavirus exists as a swarm, a quasi-species, a uh, complex set of different types of virus strains that could then be selected based on immune selection or antiviral therapy and so on. So what do we see and the take-home message is what we see now are these emerging variants is not really a surprise. It's just basically the interaction of the virus with the host uh, perhaps even the additional pressure that we're putting on these quasi-species with these vaccines that ultimately uh, selected variants would be uh, selected, replicating at higher level. And we can see either increased pathogenicity or hopefully in the long run, a decreased pathogenicity as the virus evolves and adapts uh, to the host. So in brief then, um, I've done that introduction in the past. I just want to remind you that corona SARS viruses are not particularly new to us right now. We had the severe acute respiratory syndrome back in 2002, also from, uh, from uh, China originated, belonged to the beta coronavirus group. It was also transmitted from bats to civets, and civets was the intermediate host uh, to humans. We had an outbreak, uh, uh, more than 8,000 cases, 774 deaths, and a fatality rate of 9.6%. So this virus was quite uh, lethal, but it did not spread very well, and that has to do with uh, the receptors that the virus was using at the time. So it was very quickly contained, and we didn't have major uh, uh, epidemics and pandemics. We also have the uh, cousin virus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, MERS, another coronavirus, is 2012, originally in Saudi Arabia. Again, the same group of uh, viruses. It was transmitted from camels to humans, more than 2,400 cases, 858 deaths, and a fatality rate of 34.4%. Very lethal virus. Again, it was very quickly uh, isolated because the transmissions were also only in nosocomial in hospital settings, and uh, uh, they were very uh, easily contained because the virus was not easily transmissible. And now we have the 2019 uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, that appeared in Wuhan, uh, uh, China, and it's the seventh coronavirus found to cause illness in humans. Mind you, we have four other human coronaviruses that are really uh, seasonal, so every year, 15 to 20% of respiratory infections are caused by these already pre-existing coronaviruses. In fact, there is a hypothesis that perhaps exposure to these viruses may in, uh, in fact uh, uh, pre uh, prevent subsequent at least lethal infection, but that has not been proven uh, yet. So I wanted to also tell you that not only uh, as we will discuss that uh, the replication machinery of these viruses create quasi-species and variants that could be ultimately selected, but the actual pool of those viruses uh, in bats, and this is the different types of viruses we've seen from different vectors, uh, and the coronaviruses have originated from bats and the SARS-CoV-2, the, there are over 400 genotypes of SARS-CoV-related viruses in bats right now that have been cataloged uh, uh, mainly from China. And we don't know what other type of coronavirus exists in bats elsewhere. So there is not only ability of the virus to uh, alter itself uh, during its replication uh, cycle, but also the fact that there is a plethora of these types of viruses, different genotypes already pre-existing uh, giving the possibility that any of these viruses could emerge to be a pathogenic viruses, a virus in humans. We also know a lot about coronaviruses um, from uh, other coronaviruses that affect humans. And you can see here a number of different coronaviruses on the uh, older category of uh, different groups, uh, one, two, three, alpha, beta, gamma, and ultimately the delta group. 
And you have the human coronavirus, the 20ME in the alpha group, but we have also transmissible gastroenterovirus, porcine coronavirus, uh, the feline infectious peritonitis virus, very uh, lethal in cats, uh, and canine coronavirus and others. And of course, under the beta group, we have the mouse hepatitis virus. And mouse hepatitis virus is actually a coronavirus that very accurately depicts the symptoms and disease patterns of uh, human uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in mice. In fact, there is a very nice model for uh, uh, studying the immunopathobiology path of coronaviruses in the mouse uh, system. And um, also, and these viruses have been extensively studied uh, their tropism, um, most of them are respiratory, but also enteric. They can alter between respiratory and enteric, as we see also for SARS-CoV-2, as you're familiar with uh, from all the news that have uh, and the publications that uh, have transpired so far. So again, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the new virus, um, uh, it, it affects uh, humans. It, there's some indications that may affect certain animals, but uh, not really at the level where they would be used for uh, transmission. Um, and then we have respiratory mostly infection, but also enteric and multi-organ infection at some point, including neurological tissues and neurological symptoms that are created because of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So uh, in our lab, we worked uh, also on bovine coronaviruses, respiratory coronaviruses. And that's where in a number of papers uh, in the early 2000s, the late 90s, uh, we described the quasi-species. And we really uh, discussed the fact that the unique replication and transcriptional strategies of coronaviruses may be causing in vivo generation of viral quasi-species. That is this variants that ex exist it can be selected upon uh, uh, different pressure. In fact, for bovine coronaviruses, there are distinct genotypes that affect the mostly respiratory or mostly enteric. And most likely, the hypothesis for us at that point was that the acute respiratory disease syndrome in cattle was really caused by bovine respiratory coronavirus uh, that then um, was followed by Pastuella hemolytica infection, which is a bacterial infection. And this is exactly what we see now in SARS-CoV-2 infections. So if we look very briefly on the life cycle of the coronaviruses, the virus is an envelope virus. It has a glycoprotein, the major spike glycoprotein on the surface. This is the one that really binds the receptors. The different receptors uh, really determines the host range of the virus. The virus then will enter through endocytosis. It will fuse out of the endosome and uh, then it will be ready for replication. The replication of the uh, plus strand RNA, so the RNA is uh, an mRNA polarity, which is actually capped in poly 8 at the very end. And it goes through a negative sense uh, anti-genome, uh, replicative intermediate. And then from there on, you have subgenomic messages. All those really uh, use a negative uh, DNA intermediate to produce subgenomic mRNAs. And this is one of the mechanisms where mutations are created. And in fact, the level of variance at the mRNA uh, replicative intermediates is much higher than what you see on the viral genome, because by the time they replicate and embed it into the genome, there's proofreading activity and stability selection to select a virus that will be uh, stable in terms of the replication uh, properties. So this is uh, for mouse hepatitis virus, but uh, out of um, uh, uh, virology textbook. And you can see the fact that uh, you have up to 31,526 uh, nucleotides. They typically, and uh, I'll discuss later for SARS-CoV-2, you have uh, approximately 14 to 15 different operating frames coding for over 27 different proteins. And that enhanced uh, protein content is because of proteolytic cleavage. Uh, the virus codes its own protease and prot here that uh, uh, process different proteins to uh, create uh, more active functional uh, subsequences, sub uh, proteins. And also, um, uh, it uses, as I said earlier, the different types of RNAs that are 5 prime, 3 prime co terminal, having the poly A tail and the 5 prime M of the uh, uh, genome sequence. And this is done through a discontinuous uh, replication where basically during the negative intermediate, the polymerase jumps at the end of that sequence through uh, regulatory sequences and adds the five prime sequence. And that uh, specific phenomenon is actually error prone. Uh, 
And this is the uh, 2019 uh, viral uh, genome uh, for SOSCAV2. Again, as I said, 14 operating frames, 27 different proteins. Uh, another mechanism to increase the protein content is uh, ribosomal uh, shifting, uh, slipping, where basically during the polymerase here, you could have a ribosomal shift and produce different types of proteins. The major spike protein is the fusogenic protein that determines host range because it has the binding domain uh, for different types of receptors. But also importantly enough, the virus encodes a number of different other proteins, non-structural proteins. Some of them are structural, like the E protein and M protein and N, but others are non-structural and have important and yet most of mostly unknown functions uh, regulating innate immune response. And that's also pretty important because some of the variants that we see are not only in receptor binding or determining constraints, but some of the nucleotide and amino acid changes uh, may be in some of these proteins that relate to how the virus controls the innate immune response and uh, the sub uh, subsequent uh, downstream adaptive immune response. So um, I think uh, Elia would elaborate further uh, this importance of the spike protein. The spike protein is the uh, only fusogenic protein that determines the viral entry binding onto receptors and fusion. Um, it, uh, we know uh, that the S1 domain uh, that contains the uh, receptor binding domain uh, determines tissue tropism and it's, uh, it's sensitive to different pH conformations. In order for this uh, fusogenic proteins, the type one class one viral fusion proteins to uh, exert their membrane fusion ability, they have to really open up exposing a fusion peptide, which then intercalates in the opposed membrane, creates a pore function where the trimer assembles uh, to create that pore and that uh, results in fusion of the viral envelope with cellular membranes uh, during exocytosis from the endosome or in certain other viruses during entry at the plasma membrane. And of course, the spike uh, protein is the major uh, immunogenic uh, protein, the antigen, and this is used extensively in the vaccines that we'll discuss briefly here. Then again, what I mentioned as a mechanism for entry, you have the viral spike protein attaching to a receptor, potentially other co-receptors. Then you have a conformational change and ultimately exposes the fusion peptide here in red uh, to the opposed membrane, and then the trimer is reassembled in the opposed uh, membrane to create the pore uh, to mediate the membrane fusion phenomenon that the results in the uh, viral capsid uh, freeing into the cytoplasm of infected cells. Again, uh, in terms of receptors, I mentioned the fact that we know a lot about the different receptors. We know that some of these viruses, transmission of gastroenterovirus, uses the uh, porcine uh, APN molecule. Uh, the uh, uh, different other molecules have actually used that too. Uh, but we also have the calcium-bryonic antigen M1 for mass hepatitis virus would be well characterized, as well as the, as a co-receptor, the in, uh, all linked acetyl uh, uh, uh So these uh, receptors, the binding to these different receptors, really, as I said, the host range of the virus. And of course, for SARS-CoV-2, uh, we know now that uh, it uses the angiotensin 2 as 2 receptor. Uh, and in fact, it contains additional elements for efficient proteolytic cleavage and exposure of the fusion peptide. That's why this virus is quite efficient in infection as well as spread. And we know that uh, from our animal studies, the deletions of the spike protein uh, can change or amino acids can change virulence and tissue tropism. One specific example is transmissible gastroenteritis virus, which is really an enteric, very high uh, uh, pathogenic enteric disease in piglets. But if you delete 225 amino acids from the amino terminals from the S1 uh, amino terminal portion of spike, you create a porcine coronavirus, which only causes mild respiratory disease of pigs and some interstitial pneumonia. So we know that the spike protein, its receptor binding ability and its fusiogenic functions are very important in terms of this pathogenicity. We also, uh, I wanna highlight these two papers that we published back in 2005 and 2007 for SARS-CoV-1 uh, with uh, Chad Petit, who is now an associate professor at the uh, University of Alabama in Birmingham. And the only thing I wanted to tell you is that we found that not only mutations as would you'd expect, 
in the, uh, in the extracellular portion of spike, but also mutations of the carboxy terminus of the spike glycoprotein would affect the fusogenic ability and uh, binding and functions of the receptor. So it's not necessarily that you have mutations only in the binding or in perhaps fusion peptide, but they could be distal and through conformational changes alter the function of the protein, altering its host range and perhaps its ability to uh, infect uh, efficiently and spread. We recently, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Sidrama Joyce at uh, ULM, we published this paper and I borrowed one figure from that. What we did, we uh, took the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-1 and which is called uh, SARS-OLD and the SARS, uh, spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 neum, and we expressed it transiently in uh, African green monkey cells, and then we stained them uh, for expression. And we wanted to see if the different proteins express, uh, cause different types of cell-to-cell -cell fusion, which is an indication of the ability of the spike protein to really facilitate more efficient entry, as well spread from cell-to-cell -cell through a cell-to-cell -cell fusion mechanism. As you can see, the old one causes limited fusion on African green monkey cells, viral cells here, although the new uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus causes extensive fusion. And this is also a, uh, a property of the virus that is not frankly paid uh, much attention in the literature because this virus not only enters more efficiently through a, an enhanced fusogenic ability of the spike protein, but also can spread from cell to cell by fusing adjacent cells. That is then you could potentially have a high level neutralizing antibody uh, in your lung um, uh, fluids, but in reality, the virus can spread from cell to cell without necessarily seeing the extracellular space. So uh, I wanted to bring your attention again to the accessory proteins uh, for uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Although they uh, have similarities to SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, there are also differences and some of the pathogenic potential of SARS-CoV-2 may be relating and uh, depending on some of these proteins that uh, regulate the immune system. And if you look at the functions that have been predicted, and again, we don't know a lot about all these proteins, you can see that a number of these proteins relate to uh, innate immune responses. For instance, 3A uh, is incorporated to virum particles and upregulates in kappa beta, IL-8, Arantis, and so on. It has also a role in apoptosis induction and cycles arrest. Uh, 3B, uh, we don't know if it's incorporated in the virion particle, but it has a type 1, affects type 1 interferon production and signaling inhibition. Again, 6 and so on type interferon production. And um, uh, 8B, cell DNA synthesis, cut space independent cell death, apoptosis and anti-apoptotic functions. So the um, it, then it's easy to see and project that some of these proteins would be very important in how the virus deals with the innate immune response, evading the innate immune response, and any other um, defense mechanism, including apoptosis, that the cells may have in order to really be successful as an infectious pathogen. So I want to now to focus uh, on the new variants and try to make some extrapolations as a background to what uh, uh, Ilaya Brodsky will be talking about. And this is really from the uh, Central Disease Control page, this is practically verbatim. As we know, we have the, um, that's been all over in the news now, the B117 lineage, uh, which is the variant of concern because uh, it's been hypothesized that uh, not necessarily more lethal, but apparently up to 50% or higher, more transmissible. And yet they, we don't know exactly what that means but uh, that's been mostly on some clinical data and anecdotal evidence as opposed to real experiments that uh, could really uh, be subject to peer review. The variant has a mutation in the receptor binding domain of the spike at position 501, uh, and amino acid asparagine has been replaced with tyrosine. So this shorthand for this mutation is N51Y that you see in the literature. And the variant also has several other mutations, including uh, a deletion of two amino acids, that occurs spontaneously and like leads to conformational changes in the spike protein and the mutation of uh, proline 68 to histidine near the S1 to a furin cleavage site. And that furin site is really processing the S1, S2 uh, cleavage to facilitate exposure to the fusion peptide and increase fusionicity. There's also a stop code on or, on or fate, uh, and this function is uh, unknown. 
The variant was estimated to have first emerged in the UK. Uh, since December 20, there are several countries that have reported cases of being 117 including the United States and Canada first reported in Colorado and uh, um, yeah, California, as well now apparently in New York. The variants associated with increased transmissibility, more efficient as said rapid transmission, and there's no evidence so far to suggest that this variant has any impact on the severity of disease or vaccine efficacy. However, it's noted that the uh, now the um, population that's been affected increasingly are younger populations. So perhaps this increased uh, transmission has something to do with this that gets transmitted uh, more efficiently into a younger uh, uh, patients. The second one is the B1351 lineage. The, uh, this particular virus has multiple mutations in the spike protein, including uh, the, these mutations uh, indicated here in red. But unlike the B117 lineage, uh, as detected in the UK, this variant does not contain the deletion of 6970 that are noted earlier. This was actually identified in South Africa uh, in samples back uh, beginning of October 20, and cases have been uh, detected uh, outside of South Africa. The, uh, the variant was also identified in Zambia, and currently there's no evidence to suggest that this variant has any impact on disease severity. There is some evidence to indicate, though, that one of the spike protein mutations, the E484K, may affect neutralization by some polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. And that would be the expectation uh, based on the fact that uh, these, hosts, these viruses have gone through hosts that mount their own immune responses, not necessarily be subject to monoclonal antibody therapy or any of the vaccines. Uh, they may already be selected as uh, immune escape uh, variants. And the last one I will mention that uh, is also mentioned at CDC is the uh, uh, this particular uh, P1 lineage, the uh, uh, mutation that's shown here. And this one is uh, 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 has 17 unique amino acids and three deletions and contains these mutations. There's no evidence to suggest that some of these mutations in the P1 variant may affect the transmissibility uh, and the genetic profile uh, so far. But a recent study reported on a cluster of these cases in Manaus, the largest city in the Amazon region. Um, and, it, and in this region, it is estimated approximately 75% of the population had been infected with SARS-CoV-2 as of October 2020. And perhaps this high level of infectivity led to this uh, variant uh, being selected much quicker than it would be in other parts of the, of the uh, world. Uh, the emergence of this variant raises substantial concerns of a potential increase in transmissibility or propensity for SARS-CoV-2 infections of individuals because of the plethora of these mutations and deletions across the genome. They uh, uh, obviously, what are the potential consequences of having these variants? You could see that in red, and I'll go fairly briefly on that. Uh, the ability to spread more quickly in people. We've seen this. There's already evidence that one mutation that uh, the uh, 60, D6014 to G glycine mutation confers increased ability to spread more quickly than the wild type virus. Uh, this particular variant uh, propagates more quickly in human respiratory epithelial cells in cell culture, outcompeting the uh, 614D original wild type viruses. There's also epidemiologic evidence that the 614G variant spreads more quickly than viruses without the mutation. The other consequence would be the ability to cause either milder or more severe disease in people. Uh, so far, there's no evidence that these recently identified core viruses cause more severe disease than the early ones, other than the fact that there is a strong uh, indication or suspicion that these viruses are transmitted more efficiently. The ability to evade detection by specific diagnostic tests is of concern. Most commercial polymerase chain reaction tests have multiple targets, though, to detect the virus. Uh, as the ones that we use here for wastewater uh, detection in our laboratory for this panel which parish in LSU. So basically by having multiple sets of PCR primers, you would avoid the fact that maybe you, uh, uh, you will be unable to detect the specific uh, um, variant. Uh, and, but that needs to be looked at every time a variant comes in because it's possible by accident that the PCR primers that are selected really target those altered mutations, in which case you won't be able to see that. Oops. Uh, decrease susceptibility to therapeutic agents as monoclonal antibodies. Obviously, if you had targets of monoclonal antibodies, like monoclonal antibody therapy, which uh, the President Trump was treated with, if there is that area where the, uh, the single amino acid change could really knock out the monoclonal antibody therapy uh, fairly uh, easily. 
and ability to evade natural vaccine-induced immunity. And that's where basically these open, all other open ready frames are very important the mutations because we really do not understand the immunopathogenesis of these viruses. So everybody's concentrating on the spike protein because the easier target, but in reality, there are many other things that we need to know of how this virus really controls uh, the immune response uh, uh, and causes uh, pathogenicity. Uh, in terms of vaccines, very quickly, I wanted to just give you a you know 30,000 mile uh, view of vaccinology. We have been working on vaccines for coronaviruses quite some time, uh, successfully in many a number of instances unsuccessfully. We have live attenuated vaccines for uh, porcine endemic uh, disease virus. Uh, and that's been done by a serial passage of the virus say, 90 times or more in African green monkey cells. The infectious bronchitis virus it has multiple serotypes and there are vaccines for EBV right now through a similar type of mechanism. Uh, we have killed vaccines that uh, uh, have been used for canine coronavirus, uh, infectious bronchitis virus, not, not as successfully, but at least they provide some uh, protection. And there are vector vaccines, including adenovirus vaccines uh, for lactogenic immunity with transmissible gastroenterovirus and uh, baculovirus for uh, the spike SMN uh, that has been used for uh, preventing enteric uh, challenges. There's also passive immunization using neutralizing monoclonal antibodies as already has been used for SARS-CoV-2 and at the end of and end of body dependent enhancement with uh, uh, feline coronavirus vaccines. So uh, for COVID-19 vaccines uh, that are in human trials and uh, already been uh, out there in the market, uh, as you know, mRNA 1273 uh, for Moderna is really the, uh, uh, the entire spike protein, at least the entire extracellular portion of the spike protein. Uh, it has passed the phase three is actually in the market. It requires uh, two, do two doses, uh, 28 days apart, and uh, it has been shown to be uh, 94 to 95% efficacious in terms of preventing the uh, disease uh, onset. The mRNA BNT162 Pfizer, uh, it has only uh, the uh, RBD, the receptor binding domain linked to a fibrin uh, neck that uh, facilitates trimerization. And so basically it's a much uh, smaller target in terms of vaccine. And that similarly has passed uh, phase three trials and that uh, creates a single or two doses that uh, uh, administered a few weeks apart. We have a number of other vaccines that are coming uh, into play. We have the Novio Pharmaceutical Inc. that has a DNA plasmid. We have the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies, uh, Johnson & Johnson as an adenovirus 5 uh, vector uh, vaccine. And uh, Oxford uh, University with AstraZeneca in collaboration with the uh, Russian uh, uh, company uh, with Sputnik, uh, which is the vaccine, adenovaccine. They use a simian vector to express the spike protein for vaccine purposes. And they report uh, 50 to 90% uh, efficacy also for this. And those will be, are in the market already. Uh, at least the adenoviral vectors are in the market. Um, and th then again, this is something about uh, why uh, the dosage here. You could see that the Moderna, you have uh, up to 100, uh, uh, really micrograms of uh, per dose. That's a lot of RNA, which is pretty codon optimized and includes uh, specific ribonucleotide uh, uh, nucleotides that are being placed as uh, synthetic there to downregulate the immune response recognition by TLR3, TLR4, and TLR7, because RNA in itself is very inflammatory. And in fact, in certain patients in Germany and elsewhere were accidentally were given five times the dose. Uh, they had severe problems, inflammatory response, anaphylactic shock, and so on. Uh, they have different requirements being frozen or not. And the, the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, requires a minus 70 degrees because really it's a much smaller protein and they need to preserve the trimer, uh, otherwise it falls apart. Although the Moderna has the entire spike that uh, naturally forms a trimer. And those both, uh, the Moderna has a NIH-driven mutation and I think Lai will talk about this, that keeps the spike protein in an open conformation, exposing the RBD domain to increase the uh, ability to create neutralizing antibodies uh, against the RBD domain. I want to also tell you that uh, we know in the past for uh, uh, SARS-CoV-1 that uh, neutralizing antibodies and uh, memory B cell responses are short-lived in SARS recovered patients, in human patients. And you can see here that in some of these patients that uh, is the cohort in self in black, patient A, patient B, that over time, 
uh, in months, you can see that the immune response, the B cell response, the antibody response to be waned out. And the question is, although the studies have been done for two, three months right now, it will be very interesting to see what the results are six months uh, down the road, whether you know B and T cell uh, responses are really surviving and uh, they're not weighing out and whether those people being vaccinated are protected in the long term. So this is what I wanted to tell you in brief, um, if I want to sort of uh, uh, quickly summarize before I recognize my staff here, is that uh, two things, uh, SARS-CoV uh, genotypes exist as a plethora of genotypes in bats right now, over 400 genotypes. In addition, the replication machinery of these coronaviruses creates this uh, quasi-species, these variants in cell culture that could be easily selected based on external uh, stimulus and external selection, whether that would be an antiviral or a immune selection. So it's not surprising then that we could see variants evolving. These variants were not really uh, caused by mutational rates of the RDP polymerase, although that also could play into this, but it could be also pre-existing as part of the quasi-species that are naturally selected. In fact, I think Eli will mention a recent paper where they took the virus SARS-CoV-2 and they put it in soil culture in the presence of human antibody, and they selected variants fairly easily that mimic some of the viruses that we've seen uh, so far. Um, so we are really at the beginning of understanding how these viruses evolve. I think bioinformatic analysis is extremely important because as we see these variants are coming through and maybe even detected them ahead as part of the quasi-species, we could potentially predict the outcome of these variants, who, which one would uh, persist or uh, create uh, a different uh, pathogenic profile. So I want to uh, thank you for your attendance and I want to acknowledge uh, people in my lab, uh, the um, uh, general, general medical virology cover um, and paper on nelfinavir, the difference between spike uh, proteins for SARS-CoV-1 and 2 were worked uh, uh, by Dr. Fahana Musarat and uh, Dr. Vladimir Cholchenko. Uh, also, everybody else in the lab has contributed to a lot of the work that we're doing so far, including some of our vaccine efforts that are ongoing. Uh, we have in the lab uh, adenoviral vectors and herpes vectors that express uh, spike protein and we're actively involved in vaccine experiments. And of course, all our collaborators and acknowledge the collaboration with Lai Brodsky and the Tober Bioinformatics Research Center at the University of Haifa, which is really where um, Elia originated, at least the company got spun off from that Tober Center. So thank you. And uh, we can proceed then, uh, Elia, with your presentation, unless there are some questions at this point. I don't know how you want to handle that. Thank you, Gus. Yeah, so I imagine that some people might have questions about your presentation. So we'll just, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We will address them maybe towards the end of my part of the presentation, which is not going to be very long. So um, again, if you have any questions, uh, and thank you, Gus, for the presentation, please uh, put those in the chat. Um, so um, what I wanted to do is kind of uh, pick up on some of these topics and expand a little bit uh, to talk about the bioinformatic aspect of how we can piece together this data. Where does the biology or the biological understanding of this virus intersect with the data that is available and that is being generated daily? And how do we piece together the whole puzzle to kind of think about the impact of this uh, rollout of the vaccines and uh, the impact of how uh, diverse the virus will eventually become as these additional treatments are introduced and being used more widely. So as uh, Gus already mentioned, uh, many of the vaccines and early research on coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2 uh, primarily has been focused on this key uh, role of the spike protein, which plays an important role in uh, zoonotic transmission um, and in general in cell entry. And so when we look at the SARS-CoV-2 genome, you can see it's encoded right here um, in uh, this region. And uh, what it does is it has this particular property 
uh, that it actually um, is formed by these two subunits. And uh, those are cleaved uh, so that the uh, S1 subunit can uh, attach to the membrane. So what you can see here is the significance of some of those terms that uh, Gus was using throughout his part of the lecture, uh, the receptor binding domain uh, and uh, different parts of this uh, spike glycoprotein. So um, what has happened since then is that uh, there has been a continuation of uh, data collected from these different studies. And so here we see an excellent example of how structurally people have started to understand um, the way that this protein works. And so what was done in this study is that um, this spike glycoprotein uh, was captured, connected to the virion itself. And you can see that the virion actually contains um, uh, both of these uh, conformations. So you can see um, that in general it has two forms. Uh, the thin structure uh, that resembles this needle-like post-fusion structure, and uh, then the wider one, which is the pre-fusion structure. And when they captured this intact virion, about 97% were pre-fusion and about 3% were post-fusion, um, and uh, about 25 in total per virion. The researchers also examined the thin and the wide uh, trimer shapes and found that they showed um, a very um, interesting correspondence. So we don't know everything about how this works in real life, but this kind of data really allows us to see um, uh, this structure intact. And so what is um, interesting about the structure is that it's not static. It's not always kind of uh, protruded uh, uh, outward, but it actually can be found in many of these uh, so it's kind of shaking, right? So you can see right here uh, that perhaps it's uh, kind of dynamic. Um, and so um, it also could be in multiple ways, either open, closed, two open, uh, three closed, one open, right? So there's a variety of shapes that you can expect here. So to really understand how this connects with the genomic data, I think it's important to appreciate the data, the majority of the data that we have is actually genomic sequencing data. And so the genomic sequencing data, when it is pieced together with this kind of an understanding of the structure of these proteins, it really provides a lot of insight, I think, into how we can understand what's going on. So here you can see this S1 subunit on top, the S2 subunit on the bottom, and uh, here's a little video of what happens if you uh, detach the top part. So it's like a cap that's sitting on top. And the reason I'm showing this is because I think once we go into the specific mutations, it becomes very interesting when you think about how does this practically work? So, um, uh, when originally the major question was about the origin of this coronavirus, and I guess uh, explained it in great detail, um, one of the major findings during that time was that the novel coronavirus was very similar to one of the bad coronaviruses that was captured not long before the human uh, version was sequenced. And so um, one of the questions would be, well, what is different between bats and humans that so many different viruses that end up uh, becoming endemic or pandemic um, acquire these properties? So how does that environment really play a role in what happens? And so one of the things that you see here, you probably already recognize that the majority of these mutations that are uh, differences essentially between the RAD G13 genome and the human COVID-19 genome um, are found in this receptor binding domain region. Uh, but also if we look overall how these relate to other bad coronaviruses and other SARS-like coronaviruses, um, we can see that there are very specific properties um, that have been um, acquired through this transformation. And so one of the questions um, that was posed in this paper was um, what is so unique about bats uh, that kind of uh, you know, puts them in the center of all of these uh, pandemics? Uh, 
And so um, on et al uh, provide evidence that one mechanism bats have evolved to limit excessive inflammation during viral infection is through dampened transcriptional priming and lower functional capacity of the bat inflammasome sensor and our family pyrin domain containing three, um, which is NL NORP3, and it functions as a pathogen recognizing receptor to activate inflammatory mediators. Uh, so this inflammation has also been linked to aging and age-related chronic diseases. And the study provides a mechanism for and a provisional answer to whether bats have evolved to tolerate or resist viral infection. So this work really suggests that bats have adapted to tolerate viral infection without development of pathology through inflammation. Uh, which explains essentially that the virus can replicate in a bat without leaving the same host for long periods of time. In fact, I think in this paper, it was mentioned that it could be um, uh, several months that the virus replicates continuously inside the bat. And this is very different from the types of hosts that do show uh, inflammation, uh, that have uh, kind of acute disease. Um, and um, as a result of both the pressure that the virus is under and the long time that it can uh, kind of exist in a single host makes it a unique situation where many novel uh, mutations, recombination, um, and uh, properties are acquired. So to understand some of these properties, right, we started talking about the different domains and so one of these regions in the receptor binding domain, which you can see here on top, is really the binding to the ACE2 uh, receptor. And so it's um, uh, easy to kind of imagine how because of this evolutionary pressure for the virus to escape this high pressure environment in the bat, find new um, hosts, eventually it is able to um, primarily kind of adapt to these novel ACE2 variants that are found in other hosts. And so what we can see in this original uh, kind of those mutations that we were looking at, right, is that those mutations are very close to that binding. Um, so again, this is a trimer. So you can see here three times it's the same thing is replicated and only one of the receptor binding domains is um, open. And so you can see the ACE2, the portion of the ACE2 that is bound to this receptor. So when we look at these mutations that are found specifically in that uh, portion. So now the question is, right, so this was about the origin and this was about the question, well, how did the virus acquire the certain properties? How was it introduced into the human population? And so now we have a lot more information about what happened after that. So essentially, if we look now, uh, this was taken uh, yesterday, I think. So this is uh, from Next Strain, a um, website that displays genomic information collected from around the world and analysis of that genomic information to understand the relationship between the different clades that are emerging. And what you can see here is, first of all, how uh, the different clades are divided up throughout the world. Uh, on the website itself, you can see a nice animation of how the viral strains kind of originated from different places. And that's essentially the goal of this analysis here on the side is to demonstrate how individual dots, which are samples, are uh, representative of different clades. And so you can see a phylogenetic tree. And if you see here on top, there is a total of uh, 12 clades, right? So right here, if you just count these up, there's a total of 12 clades. Now, what's interesting is that this is showing essentially one year. So from January, 2020 to January, 2021, you can see how um, for a variety of reasons, really, uh, there has been a gradual increase in the number of clearly defined Clades. So you can see here we've got three up until about February, and then we have about five here until May, and then about seven to eight kind of emerge over this period of time because one of them kind of disappears almost. And then today we're looking at um, 10 kind of major uh, clades that are known. And then uh, here, if you actually count all of these, you can see that some of them are very minor, right? So some of them are either emerging just like we saw here. So some of them are emerging and growing in number, or some of them could be uh, just kind of uh, coming, appearing and disappearing. 
And so the reason I'm showing this is because we now have this uh, tremendous collection of genomic information. On one hand, it allows us to analyze the data and understand both the origin and the dynamics of this disease as it spreads. On the other hand, it is also limited due to a variety of biases. For example, we know that most of these samples are collected in areas of outbreak, right? So if there's not an outbreak, we don't have any information. A lot of the sequencing also happens around the major outbreaks. And so we do expect this um, data to be informative, but also some of the questions could be limited. But some information is already emerging that is going to be very interesting for us to look at today. So for example, one of the things that if we do the exact same thing on this uh, um, on next train website, you can zoom in and you can look at how specific proteins acquire mutations. So at what rate do they acquire mutations? So an interesting thing would be to look at the spike protein, just like we were looking in terms of the zoonotic transmission and ask the question, well, how are these mutations distributed throughout this Protein. So you can see here, this is the spike protein. So it's about uh, 21,600 to about 25,400. That's the um, length of this uh, 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 gene. And here you can see the S1 subunit and the S2 subunit. And so it's fairly clear that the S1 subunit has many more mutations that we can observe right here. And so here we do have some mutations, but essentially the S2 subunit has uh, less mutation. We can map this, these mutations onto the structure of this uh, protein data bank ID uh, PDB6VXX uh, and kind of see visually that the distribution is not random. So there is some pattern. And that's really what is interesting about this is what is the pattern and what is shaping the pattern of distribution of these mutations to understand how can similar events as we go through this uh, pandemic, how can uh, we kind of anticipate what's going to happen and how can we detect this early on to be prepared to what's um, uh, going to happen. So let's think about the selective pressures that this uh, virus is undergoing because right here you can see um, kind of a nice chart that was uh, published not so long ago where you can see the different uh, regions, so the different genes on the genome and the synonymous and non-synonymous mutations. And you can see that uh, ORF1A, for example, has the majority of these mutations, right? So the y-axis is the number of mutations and these are the individual genes. So the first type of uh, kind of a selective pressure that we know of is remdesivir, right? And just in general, antiviral. So how does remdesivir work? It's um, a drug that is uh, going to interfere with the uh, uh, RNA polymerase or DRP. Um, and uh, these antivirals, essentially, they are intended to stop the ability of the virus to replicate, right? So if the virus actively replicates, uh, remdesivir is supposed to reduce that number. But at the same time, it has kind of a negative effect. Why? Because the RDRP is, um, can mutate, right? So to, in order to evade this pressure, and you can see right here an example from a publication where such mutations were um, observed, essentially uh, developing resistance to this antiviral. So that's one type of pressures. The second one is interferon. So uh, because there is kind of a balance that ultimately is the most beneficial to the virus, where the host doesn't die, the host continues to live, but also the pressure is not strong enough to eliminate uh, the viral population. So when that balance is achieved, right, that is kind of the optimal situation for the virus. But right now, there is this strong immune response. We know that the virus is actively trying to control this immune response. Um, and so there is some um, optimization still in that process. And so that's another uh, kind of uh, theoretically um, evolutionary process or a pressure for the virus to achieve 
optimal balance with the immune response. And then um, the long-term immunity, right? So the antibodies is another kind of a, a pressure. So the evasion of this immune response of detection and uh, kind of a long-term sustained recognition of the virus is another major pressure. So these three pressures, and we'll talk in the end of how they relate to um, actual uh, vaccine rollout, um, are kind of strong theoretically uh, pressures that we should observe in the uh, virus. So let's see whether this has really been seen. So the first thing that we talked about is uh, remdesivir. Um, the way it happens is it actually interacts here with the RDRP. So after the virus has entered the cell and uh, the RDRP has been produced, it blocks it. And so that replication of subgenomic uh, transcription does not happen. And so what uh, happens is that it blocks a particular binding pocket. And as a result, that pocket becomes the region of active mutations. And so you can see here, um, a paper that was uh, recently published where emerging SARS-CoV-2 mutation hotspots include a novel RNA-dependent RNA polymerase variant, so RDRP mutations. And so here you have uh, the treated versus the untreated um, samples. And you can see that specifically in the treated ones, uh, there is um, uh, this kind of more narrow distribution of these mutations, which it, indicates that, um, you know, on average, there's a rate of mutation that happens throughout the whole RDRP. And then when we look at this uh, particular pressure, it is more selective. And so this is, um, again, it has not necessarily been um, studied extensively in us, enough for us to understand um, what might be the rate or at what levels of uh, remdesivir use throughout the population, these types of mutations will occur, but it still allows us to anticipate what might happen as a result of antiviral treatment. Now, um, another kind of an aspect that we talked about was this uh, ability of the virus to evade detection. Um, and one of the ways that it evades detection is by these uh, glycan molecules. So glycosylation, um, the, essentially the spike protein is covered with glycans that are preventing accurate detection of the full protein. And to remain uh, flexible enough to bind to ACE2 receptor, uh, you can see that it actually is not covered throughout. So these are mutations that happen as a result of this changing dynamic structure of these glycans that um, are covering the whole um, uh, kind of body of this uh, protein. So um, there has also been some modeling done to kind of show us what that really looks like. And so we are used to see the spike protein like this in a naked uh, shape. And here you can see a model, a computational model um, that shows what it looks like when it's covered with these glycans. And so you can see how essentially the top, this receptor binding domain is open. And so that's the critical part for detection. But then a lot of the areas are covered up with these glycans and that helps the virus evade immune detection. And so because of this, uh, we know that um, this uh, uh, you know, specific uh, receptor binding domain is so critical, not only because of the transmission, the non zoonotic transmission, but also um, as the vaccines are being developed to target that particular domain. So the other studies that also Gus has alluded to were done with the covalescent plasma. So what is covalescent plasma? Essentially, it is a plasma collected from patients that have already recovered. And so that has to do with the process of disease progression. So in the beginning, there's this acute host response, and then there's this uh, kind of uh, response that becomes a long-term response. And after that time, after the person recovers, that plasma could be collected. And essentially those antibodies are, could be used as a prophylactic or as a treatment. And so here, there is a study that was done Again, the study is not conclusive in the sense that it was not done uh, 
in animal models or patients, uh, but it has been observed. So here you can see the x-axis is time in days. So from zero to a hundred days. And here you can see um, how these mutations um, are starting to occur based on a number of kind of variations that were done in the cell culture experiment where different dosages were administered for a long time. And so here you can see different types of mutations and deletions that come out seemingly as a response of administration of this plasma. Now, one of the things that I think it's very nice to understand as you're thinking about these mutations is what is the actual structural interaction between these um, uh, antibodies and the spike protein. So um, there's actually a uh, uh, PDB structure that was published that kind of shows us exactly how that works. So here you can see this. Um, uh, so again, here it's showing the antigen binding fragments. Uh, so there's the light chain. Um, and so the, this is the outside. And uh, th so the antibody essentially is blocking, is keeping this protein inactive by uh, blocking these um, receptor binding domains in a way that they cannot access and bind to the ACE2 receptor. So I think this is uh, why it's so important for us to link the uh, mutation data and the sequencing data with the structural component because we can really understand how these interact. So it's really nice to have such models. So um, this particular antibody is called EY6A. It was uh, retrieved from an individual convalescing from COVID-19. And uh, what they have done in the study is they have shown that it neutralizes SARS-CoV-2 and cross-reacts with SARS-CoV-1. So it's actually working with both, both SARS-2 and SARS-1. Um, it binds to the receptor binding domain of the viral spike glycoprotein uh, tightly. Um, and the complex identifies the highly conserved epitope away from the ACE2 receptor binding site. Um, residues within this footprint are key to stabilizing the pre-fusion spike. So again, how effective is this going to be? This um, is actually a question, right? Because the regulation of how the spike protein opens up and how different uh, portions of it are accessible and recognizable is going to play a role in how this evolves over time. So now another example, um, I think is uh, to what Gus alluded to here um, about these quasi species or essentially how instead of what we think of one single genome in the host, essentially this is a whole population or a swarm of competing uh, virus genomes that are um, essentially suppressed by this more dominant, more effective genome. And so what has been shown fairly clearly is that most mutations are um, cleared out. And so the genome is fairly stable, not because there are no other variants out there. The population is very diverse, but the other um, kind of variants that are present in that uh, population are easily cleared out. And so one key reason for that is because the infection itself is fairly short, so that it, they don't stay in one host for a very long time. But as that time grows, that's where you can start observing um, uh, how this population really works. And so what they've done here is, uh, actually this is a, uh, I'm going to talk about a combination of two different studies. One study was with uh, immune, um, uh, so uh, people that have a poor immune response. Um, and the other one is with people that have this prolonged chronic uh, condition and eventually are treated with convalescent plasma. So um, here, um, uh, this uh, shows the um, quasi-species generation. So the wild type SARS-CoV-2, which is the most common form, um, serves as the reference RNA sequence for development um, of an assay. But we can see that this um, essentially represents a whole um, kind of, you know, each one of these clades here represents a, a population essentially. And you can see here individual patients. So individual patients are going to be 
um, uh, are going to be shown here. And you can see that some of them become outliers. And so what does it mean that they are outliers essentially by themselves? That means that they have some established strain from this population that previously has not been the dominant strain. And so when they wanted to characterize what this, these strains look like, they started looking at specific mutations in the spike glycoprotein because the only way to treat these people that have this infection for a long time is to administer them with convalescent plasma from recovered patients. And so here you can see how these specific mutations, including in the RDP, R RBD domain, um, in the fusion peptide, um, in the heptad repeat, Right, and the more importantly, they actually correspond with the epitopes that are recognized by the different antibodies. So this is one reason why prolonged infection and seemingly effective care with multiple ways to intervene in the disease actually could also bring out through selective pressure, some of the less dominant substrains that all of a sudden are not being captured in that treatment, right? So the treatment kind of suppresses the major dominant strains and these other uh, clades, these other quasi species have more freedom to replicate and become established. And so that in itself, prolonged treatment, comorbidities and uh, the treatments with antivirals and convalescent plasma could lead to that effect. Now, another implication of that, and this was proposed, this is a hypothetical, is that um, you know, theoretically, uh, non-Hispanic whites and African Americans might have differences because of similar properties, right? So here we see um, comorbidities, longer time, different types of immune responses. And uh, because of that, this kind of change in the balance of the dominant um, kind of quasi-species um, could result in uh, lower detection um, and essentially a higher mortality rate. So this was a model that somebody proposed. Uh, now, already uh, Gus mentioned here that um, uh, there, was, uh, there were additional studies on cell cultures. And uh, the object, objective of this uh, study here to show here is that um, multiple uh, mutations occur at the same time. And so you can see here mutations in the, in the E and the N protein, you can see a mutation in the RDRP, and you can see multiple mutations in ORF1A. And these mutations actually happen in different patterns at different days. And so one of the studies wanted to see what is the, again, structural component of these mutated regions. And what they have discuss, discovered is that um, one of them is directly related to resistance to antibodies because they examined a published spike uh, um, structure and kind of annotated with the residues. Um, and it showed that some of these mutations happen in a disordered glycosylated loop at the very tip of the, uh, um, at the very tip right here, uh, the NTD, and therefore could alter binding of antibodies. Uh, the other mutation right here is close to the binding site of the polyclonal antibodies derived from uh, CoV-57 plasma 6 plasma. Um, and uh, also you can see that um, a lot of these mutations essentially interact with these antibodies. So what we can understand from here is one, that the longer the um, disease, the more these mutations occur at multiple regions at the same time. And I think another interesting thing that you can see here is that there are, there are not only mutations, but there are also deletions. So another thing that I think was overlooked in the literature, there's a lot of uh, conversation about different mutations emerging and being established in these uh, clades, but not a lot of people are looking at multinucleotide deletions. So not just deletions of single nucleotides, but deletions that are longer. So here you can see some examples. So in the beginning, what happened was in this study, um, the researchers were trying to identify uh, deletions that are more than a single nucleotide. And you can see here some shorter examples, but you can also see right here, this is deletion length. And this is number of events. So if you just take all of the publicly available data, what is the distribution of deletion links? 
And here you can also see that they have annotated specific recurring deletions that are more than a single nucleotide and uh, where they also happen, right? So I think this is very interesting because um, there is this um, kind of a naturally occurring phenomenon where uh, whole portions of important genes could be deleted from the viruses. And essentially that is a part of this quasi-species dynamic where um, defective genomes uh, that might have um, profound effect on how these proteins are actually produced um, start interacting with the wild type genomes. And so this is a part that I think is going to be more and more um, explored because essentially what it shows us is that we don't even know what other members of the quasi species are out there. This is very poorly annotated and very poorly studied and at the rate of infection. And as we see the number of established clades grow and as we see the number of mutations in various regions grow, what it leads us to believe is that even though the current vaccine is going to be, and you know, there are studies ongoing right now to demonstrate whether it will be effective, uh, it's probably going to um, go from very high rates of effectiveness and that will go down. But the good side is that really these vaccines the mRNA vaccines at least, and the vaccines that are being produced kind of using uh, this uh, you know, novel technology are also much easier to manipulate. And so continuous surveillance of these viruses, especially using deep sequencing to reveal the low frequency mutations, continuous monitoring of how this uh, kind of happens within patients that we start to developing a sense of what happens in different cases in different clinical scenarios, as well as ability to understand the implication, the functional implication of these different mutations and to be able to design new versions of the vaccine, right? So I think that, you know, most of us, at least I <laughs> had this anticipation that the vaccine will be a final solution. There will be um, kind of a, a resolve of this pandemic. And, you know, it seems like this is not necessarily true. And there, there's a lot more research that is going to be needed uh, to continue and explore how the dynamic of this virus is going to continue and change, especially after such widespread vaccination. So before we conclude and go on to the questions, I briefly wanted to mention that these examples that we've introduced today are essentially um, examples that we will cover in detail in the upcoming Bioinformatics for Infectious Disease graduate course at LSU, which is also going to be available for LBRN. So um, this is something that you can learn more about on this link, and I'm going to just paste this link in uh, the chat box. And this uh, program is essentially um, uh, designed to introduce biologists and you know, those that are interested in such research uh, to be uh, efficient with the data that's out there that is being generated uh, with asking questions about the data and being able to find evidence uh, in the data itself um, to understand different methods of analysis. I think what we can see from some of the examples that we presented today is that it's not just you know the same method that solves all the um, questions really this is a combination of a variety of different methods and that includes sequence alignment that includes evolutionary studies that allow us to um, understand relationships between viruses and there are a lot of different methods for that that include a variety of different questions that could be asked it's working with the structural proteins. So all of the uh, visuals of those proteins are very easy to produce, but they are very informative when you identify those important mutations and also analysis of transcriptomic data. So how is the host responding? For example, if we delete a certain uh, protein or we introduce a mutation, how can we study the results and understand the structural um, kind of components and what is the uh, functional result of those mutations. Um, so this program is going to uh, help you understand pathogens and the diseases that they cause. We'll talk about SARS-CoV-2, but we'll also talk about other types of um, uh, pathogens. And we'll also talk about this uh, uh, pathogen-host interaction. 
Uh, we'll talk about different types of analyses, but also where to find data and how to start your uh, bioinformatic analysis from uh, data that's available. And also what are some of the applications of such analysis? How can this analysis can help us think about uh, the function? How can it help us think about vaccine design, antivirals, antibiotics, and how can it help us understand epidemiological trends and drug resistance? And also what's important is that we are going to actually take examples from the public domain of data sets that have been curated with publications. So a lot of the examples that I presented today, the data is available. In fact, in terms of how much data is available, uh, there's over 3.5 million viral sequences and over 13,000 genomes out there. So there's a huge variety of data. This data is easy to find and easy to use. And uh, importantly, I think since Ebola virus, which was really the first example when, um, you know, immediately almost in real time, uh, so much data has become available with COVID because so much focus on COVID and because the availability of the sequencing technologies, uh, that rate of sequencing and availability of data has grown many fold. And today there are, just for SARS-CoV-2, there are over 180,000 SRA runs, which are fast Q files with a lot of information in them, um, over 50,000 nucleotide uh, records. And so um, a lot of this continues to uh, kind of accelerate as we speak. Um, importantly, I think that these data sets can provide us with important insights. And so specifically, we'll look at examples of how to correlate genomic diversity with population, for example, geographic location. We'll talk about immune responses and how to find biomarkers. And we'll also talk about association between pathogens and the microbiome. And we'll also look at not just the nucleotide and structure, but we'll also look at pathway analysis and interpretation and things like that. Um, we'll take a look at different types of sequencing methods and how those different sequencing methods produce different type of data and different type of data could be analyzed using different types of resources. And we'll also introduce you to some of the typical analyses without the need to use coding. So we'll do some coding, but we'll also primarily focus on the logic of analysis. So how to ask the right question, how to find the right method for analysis, and also how can multiple methods of analysis could be combined together to really develop a sense of what's going on in these complex relationships like quasi-species and haplotypes or the emergence of more differential mutations or less differential mutations and how can we think about asking those right questions and answering them with the correct methods? Um, so we have prepared a number of uh, kind of curated projects as I mentioned that will explain some of these for both asynchronous and in-person sessions that we'll do on Zoom just like this. And we'll also be able to share those for further study after that. And so an important part that I wanted to mention is that all of these program resources are going to be available not just for this graduate course, but also for the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network. So the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network uh, will um, offer a lot of these resources as a synchronous resources for faculty uh, to use and uh, teach the students. And also to kind of explain how all of this works, we will have, uh, we will have a special program that's going to last for uh, from now all the way until the summer where um, you can have access to 16 different hands-on asynchronous courses, uh, the cloud research tools, uh, some coding practical tools in R and Python, and online support from instructors. And um, I just uh, wanted to make sure that we kind of cover all of these options. And in um, maybe the future, we'll also introduce in greater detail, specifically, what will the structure of the programs be like and how these programs can help faculty, graduate students, as well as undergraduate students. So at this point, I'm going to pause and just see if there are any questions. Um, so again, uh, I, will, um, I will read out some of the questions that are available right here in the chat. Uh, 
Okay, so um, Therese is asking what percent of the viral genome needs to be changed, mutated for a strain to be typically considered a quasi-species? Um, so Gus, would you like to answer that or, or do you want me to handle this? Uh, you know, uh, you could take a shot at this and I could add to this if you want to like it. Okay, so the um, idea behind quasi-species is to identify, so if you imagine a fast Q file and it has a variety of reads, and we're talking about here whole genomes, is to identify groups. So it's not necessarily how many mutations, right? So specifically when we talk about quasi-species, it's the detection of those and grouping them by similarity. So what could be found is, for example, mutations that are in close proximity in one region, right? And there's a lot of them, or you can find many of them distributed throughout the genome. So it's not the number, it's more how do they form groups? Because the main thing here is to differentiate between errors in sequencing and some technical variants, as opposed to actual biological representative of a genome uh, that is potentially in this sample. Uh, did you want to add to that, Jeff? Yeah, so <clears throat> basically quasi-species is really dependent on the, the replication kinetics. Um, so if you look at cell culture, what we've done with bovine corona uh, and Dr. Vladimir Chilzenko looked at that. If you look at the level of mutations that the subgenomic messages are actually quite higher than what you see in the genome, as Elia mentioned, because they're selected out for stability purposes of the genome level. So there is a real swarm of viruses, but uh, most of them are really on lower, they're selected out. So they're predominant uh, variants or predominant genotypes versus minor genotypes. But um, because of this swarm being available uh, based on some selection, in cell culture, in the absence of an external selection, you're gonna get a virus which would be much easier to replicate. So it may not need specific functions. So you are prone to get more deletions and for non-essential genes because the virus is optimizing its genotype to really replicate efficiently in cell culture without having to worry about um, an immunological function. And specifically for uh, African green monkey cells, which are interferon, uh, type 1 interferon negative, there's no even interferon uh, involvement. So basically you're going to see certain variants uh, uh, be selected because of the fact that there's no interfering around that uh, perhaps would uh, influence the replication. Uh, but I think the, uh, the point to be to impress is that um, the virus has quasi-species, swarm of viruses, in addition to mutational rates of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And so it would be quite easy for new variants to be created, as Elia mentioned, um, based on even longer infection. So the longer the infection, the higher the chance of a, um, a variant to be selected. And this is the issue because typically in SARS-CoV-2, you may have um, two to 14 days, up to three weeks uh, from primary infection to show symptoms. The virus could replicate for up to two, three weeks. And you may, the virus may be uh, around for months before it gets eliminated by the immune system. In which case, by the time uh, the end result would be that uh, the virus could be transmitted in an altered form to a subsequent uh, person, especially from those shedders that have virus for a long time. Okay, so Therese, uh, hopefully, okay, yeah, so she said thank you. And uh, I do want to mention about quasi-species because I think this is a fascinating uh, question in terms of the vaccines, right? So as we think about this, um, one of the methods that I had a chance to work with was uh, called SIRSEQ. And back then it was applied to polio and dengue viruses. But the, uh, what it reveals is kind of like a fitness landscape uh, of how the virus uh, kind of uh, selects the dominant uh, genome that we essentially sequence, right? So when we sequence, the majority of the uh, sequencing information is going to come from that dominant uh, kind of genome. But if we had a lower detection limit, so the rate of errors um, would be lower, then we could pick up these lower frequency mutations. And if we do, uh, 
we could study the landscape to understand which ones are more likely to be beneficial sort of for the viral replication, for the um, overcome of these immune pressures, et cetera. So I think one of the opportunities here with these novel sequencing technologies, the longer reads, the lower error rates, uh, the novel library preparation techniques is really an opportunity to survey the population in much greater detail and perform these experiments to understand um, what's the logic behind the emergence of them, some of these uh, low frequency mutations that already exist in the population, right? They're not necessarily new mutations. They just become more detectable as we um, see the whole population kind of change because of these pressures. And as Eli mentioned, uh, the issue with these vaccines, especially the Pfizer vaccine, which is only the RBD domain, uh, obviously you do have uh, potent neutralizing antibodies created as well as CD4 or CD8 T cells. Uh, because there are epitopes there, uh, but it's very possible that the efficacy of this vaccine will wane with time. Uh, it's not going to be as bad as flu vaccines because of you know, uh, genetic diversity and reassortment, but you will be variants created, and the, uh, the end point would be that those vaccines could be efficacious at 50% or less, which require an adjustment or probably on a yearly basis or even earlier, uh, having a vaccine that may uh, then target a new genotype. All right, great. So I know that we went a little bit over time already, so we're not going to make it too long. It's already 4.20, 4.30 almost on Friday. So um, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, we will follow up. We have most of your registration information for this webinar. So we will follow up with some more information about these upcoming programs. And we will probably have another webinar about the um, specific program structure, uh, right, for uh, Louisiana Biomedical Research Network and others. And I do want to mention, I see that some people are asking here in the chat privately that um, we have some other similar programs that essentially are ongoing at University of Ghana um, and uh, with uh, um, some other universities. So we'll share that information with you um, by email. And then for the LBRN network, you'll find this information on the LBRN website. Um, although they may not be enrolled to our actual credit course right